It is a great pleasure for me that I can welcome all of you here at Natalin, at the College of Europe, to today's international conference on the 10th anniversary of the Eastern Partnership. We are extremely delighted, as you can imagine, that this conference took place here at the college, a place that is known for its interdisciplinary approach to European studies. It is known as the place where one of the best chairs on ENP, some people say that even the only one in the world, I have heard it, I have heard that, so, but I try <laughs> to put that into the context, but the chair is, the chair exists here for seven years, we have been preparing people who will be dealing with Eastern Partnership and neighborhood related matters in academia, in international organizations, in the European institutions, and in the national administration. And I think that we have been doing that with a great success. Over the past 10 years, ever since the Eastern Partnership was initiated, I proud to say that here at Natolin, we had the chance to host some 200 students coming from all six Eastern Partnership countries, thus actively, active, actively contributing to the partnership, so-called the Deliverables 18, which is strength and investment in young people, skills, entrepreneurship, and employability. In May this year, it will be exactly 10 years that the EU and the six partner countries in the EU's eastern neighborhood, Ukraine, Belarus, Moldova, Moldova, Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan, inaugurated the Eastern Partnership at the Prague Summit. The partnership was launched with a view to deepen and strengthen relations between the European Union, its member states, and six Eastern partners. The fact that this spring, the Eastern Partnership turns 10 years old, serves as the perfect opportunity for us to pause, to reflect for a moment, to take stock of what has been achieved, but also to critically, and maybe also self-critically, assess the framework shortcomings and scrutinize why some of the partnerships, many laudable ambitious, have not yet materialized. It is against this backdrop that today's conference is extremely timely and, and I value in particular the fact that it also benefits from the input of probably the most important segment of society that Eastern Partnership addresses, namely <laughs> the youth. And let me thank the students of the College of Europe for their initiative to organize this conference because I have to say, I have to underline that it was the initiative of the students they have encouraged us to organize this conference and I would like to thank them so much. And I would like to thank them also for organizing the yesterday's New Generation Summit, which I have heard was constructive, fruitful discussions and we will be able to see some fruits of this event during today's conference, as I understand in each panel, we will have the representatives of this summit and we will be able to listen to them. So thank you very much for this initiative. Um, I, I would like to add that when the summit and this initiative was announced on the website some weeks ago, the response to the ENP Society here the Students' uh, Society was overwhelming and we were really surprised having received more than 100 applications to come and to discuss the Eastern Partnership at the college. Um, so it was not easy for us uh, to decide who can come. We, uh, we were surprised, that is why we had to introduce a very, very careful selection process. And finally, uh, the summit brought together 24 participants traveling from Poland and abroad and three special guests from Eastern Partnership countries. 
and of course, uh, 12 members of our ENP uh, society. I was really very happy that the summit turned out to be successful, that young people are so active and so eager to participate in such events, which are beyond their obligations at the college, and of course, it is something which should be praised, and, and I would like to thank you so much for that. I think that I should stop, and I should, I should give the floor to those who will talk about the content of the conference. Uh, but last but not least, I would like to welcome Director General. We are very grateful that you have accepted our invitation to be today with us. Mr. Danielson, very warmly welcome at the conference. Thank you very much, and now I would like to ask Professor Tobias Schumacher, the chairholder of the only chair in the world on the ENP. <laughs> Tobias, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Vice Rector. I think this becomes a, a, a running gag, um, um, and I'm, I'm not really sure what to um, respond to that um, other than uh, to agree probably that um, de facto it is, it happens to be um, the only chair in European Neighborhood Policy Studies. Good morning, and a very warm welcome to all of you. Welcome to the College of Europe. Welcome to this international conference on the Eastern Partnership 10 years after the Prague Summit. I would like to begin by echoing the words of the Vice Rector and express also my happiness, my delight, my gratitude um, that all of you made it um, to today's conference. And I would also like to thank all those who do in fact follow us um, from all around the globe on live stream as we have received a number of uh, messages from people asking whether they can follow this conference, which is then eventually also why we decided to have a live stream. So welcome to those as well. Let me say that um, I'm particularly pleased to see so many familiar faces of long-standing friends and colleagues from all Eastern Partnership countries, from EU member states, representing academia, representing the think tank communities, representing diplomacy, the decision-making world, civil society, and thus also youth. And I very much hope that as we speak, also those who are still traveling to Natalin will also be with us very shortly. Now, as most of you know, and the Vice Rector um, stressed that point um, already, the Natalin campus of the College of Europe is particularly known for its uh, focus on the study of the European neighborhood policy and the Eastern Partnership alike, as well as for the study of the many political, security, and socioeconomic dynamics in the European Union's neighborhood as such. And it was against this very backdrop already, I think, in the summer of last year, that when we internally discussed our activities and events-related plans for this year, that is to say for 2019, that we initially already decided to organize an event on the 10th anniversary of the Eastern Partnership, but it was only literally when our student society, our ENP student society, which is very active and committed, literally pushed us the moment it had formed in October last year that this idea truly materialized. Um, and again, I would also like to express my gratitude to them for having been so adamant and forceful in pushing us to organize this event. Now, in keeping with um, Natalin's tradition of being a space of higher education, a space for critical dialogue, critical thinking, but also being a bridge builder of sorts between the scholarly community and the world of practice, I think today's conference differs 
from the many other valuable EAP-related events that are taking place these weeks and months in one particular regard. And again, the Vice Rector alluded to this already. Not only does it, of course, bring together all the many stakeholders, most of which are already assembled in this room, um, representing different walks of lives and communities from the six EAP countries and the large number of EU member states together. What is more is that by linking today's conference precisely to yesterday's first ever held Eastern Partnership New Generation Summit, which took place here at Natolin, I think today's event will also provide a platform um, for the young generation, tomorrow's leaders, if you wish, to voice their views um, and perspectives on the current status and future, potential future, of the Eastern Partnership. And I believe it is this plurality of voices um, that will give today's debate um, new impulses, or maybe even add um, some new momentum to our conversations. Talking about uh, momentum and synthesizing in a nutshell both the relevant academic and, and policy debate on the matter throughout the past um, 10 years, I think there is by and large agreement that in fact the Eastern Partnership is in need of new momentum. Even though, and I said this already earlier this morning in various private conversations as well as yesterday in another context, I think all of us are well advised to not let the many and rather obvious shortcomings bias our judgment, bias our judgment of those achievements that may be less spectacular, may not necessarily make it to the daily headlines, but are truly important and do make a difference on the ground. And I'm thinking here in particular um, of those noteworthy developments revolving around EAP deliverables, and you mentioned some of them as well, such as stronger connectivity and stronger society. Nonetheless, as I said, in the framework, or the framework rather, is arguably in need of new momentum for a number of reasons, many of which I believe, I hope, I trust we are going to discuss in the various panels um, throughout today. At the same time, and of course these two elements are connected, at the same time the Eastern Partnership is confronted with a large number of challenges on various levels, many of which are even intertwined. And for most of these challenges, I dare to say, no meaningful responses have yet even been found. Nevertheless, for the sake of maybe also contextualizing a little bit our deliberations today, let me just single out four. And of course, I don't claim um, com completion. First, over the past 10 years, the EU's eastern neighborhood, and in fact its southern neighborhood for that matter too, has increasingly become a contested space. A space in which the geopolitical scope conditions, if you wish, have changed considerably, and where more often than not, governments and societies, in fact entire political and economic regimes, have increasingly become exposed to multiple and de facto competing external influences and in fact even coercive and unlawful forms of power projection by some actors, as we all know, to an extent that was inconceivable 10 years ago when the Eastern Partnership was founded. And I say that, of course, having in mind that already back then it was founded pretty shortly after the Georgia-Russia war. Secondly, in spite of the fact that the Eastern Partnership time and again signaled the commitment of the governments of all six Eastern Partnership countries to respect the values of democracy and human rights and to align with the European Union and in fact universally valid standards of good governance and the rule of law, Political reforms continue to be either absent, are being reversed, or have lost steam 
in large parts, if I were to put it this way, of the eastern neighborhood. Thirdly, also as a result of the still pending materialization of tangible cross-societal benefits, tangible EAP dividends, economic dividends, as a result of partner countries' participation in the framework, but also in light of the hitherto unanswered question as to whether the framework is a means to an end or the end itself. Receptivity to EU policies and templates in almost all Eastern partner countries continues to be in decline. On that note, allow me to just give you one figure. According to the autumn 2018 EU Neighbours East Survey, 10 years after the inauguration of the Eastern Partnership, less than 50 percent, less than 50 percent of people in the six Eastern Partner countries, 46 percent to be precise, have a positive image of the European Union. This figure is, I think, at least inextricably linked to the fourth and last challenge I would like to mention this morning, namely whether it is actually realistic to believe that the Eastern Partnership and by extension the European Union, of course, can meet the rather diverse expectations and demands that both societies and governments in the six partner countries have. Obviously, these expectations and demands range from accession to the European Union, membership, to enhanced forms of cooperation below integration, to basically selective, purely transactional and politically cost-free cooperation, whatever that actually means. Given this diversity, I think it is not really surprising that we encounter also a multiplicity of perspectives within the European Union as to the finality of the entire process, which in turn, I dare to say, risks undermining the credibility of the EU's message among local stakeholders. Now, on this note, let me say that, uh, again, I and, in fact, all of us here at Natolina are now very much looking forward to our ensuing debates in the various panels. Again, I would like to express, we would like to express our gratitude to all of you for being with us. And I would now like to take the opportunity as well to welcome very warmly our keynote speaker this very morning, Mr. Christian Danielson, who I'm sure doesn't need to be introduced, as you all know who he is. Um, obviously, he is the Director General of the Directorate General for Neighborhood and Enlargement Negotiations um, of the European Commission. Mr. Danielson, we are very grateful to have you with us this very morning. We are very honored. And uh, as you say in Swedish, welcome in heat or taxamukke. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Professor Schumacher, thank you very much. And I'm impressed of your Swedish. Vice Rector, uh, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, friends, uh, it's great to be here. It is, uh, it is great to be here also for this uh, 10th anniversary, which is more or less today, if I'm rightly informed. And uh, as a Swede, uh, and in those days representing Sweden in Brussels, it is a particular honor to be here. Uh, this was an issue which, uh, of course, the Czech presidency in 2009 drove through. But I think we could also say that it was the fruit of close cooperation between Sweden and Poland, and uh, which, when it started up, was not all that clear that it should be the success that I would argue it is today. What I thought of doing uh, when I had this opportunity to, to address you is to say a couple of words on where we came from, and then perhaps I can't abstain from pointing to what we have achieved. Because we as Europeans have this tendency often to look into what we have not achieved and what has not worked well. But I think we need, we need also to recognize that uh, Eastern Partnership, European cooperation, and what Europe stands for is quite attractive. 
it is the envy of most, at least uh, to, to a large extent, and uh, compared to what the world looks like outside where we are today, uh, outside Europe, uh, we could probably, when it comes to the European cooperation, be proud. And I think the inspiration that is the partnership are given to many of the countries who are part of it has also been, been positive. So I thought of doing that, starting up where we come from, saying a bit about the achievements, and then landing on what uh, might be issues that we could discuss today uh, during the conference. Now, uh, let me go back to, to when this ball started. We had the 1989, we had the 1991 Soviet Union disappearing, we have the whole process towards the uh, uh, huge enlargement, and uh, we have the enlargement in 2004. And that created a sense, and I was there, that created a sense that there needed to be a perspective for uh, the countries who were, became now the new neighbors, if you can use that term, for the enlarged European Union. And that was the thinking behind the, uh, what be became something called the uh, vision of the wider Europe. Uh, it was in the beginning something that was focused primarily towards the East. It did not include the Southern Caucasus to begin with, uh, but it led through the discussion that happened in 2003, 2004, uh, to recognizing that we could not just look on three countries. We needed to look beyond, and Southern Caucasus therefore naturally came in. And in addition to that, there was a need also to not uh, look into partners only towards the east. There was also a need to look towards the south. And all of that landed in what, was the, what is today the European neighborhood policy, which the ambition was to withdraw this word create uh, a relation, a deeper relation with neighbors. Um, and when he talked to us, the East in particular, he, he used the term everything but institutions. Now that was very ambitious, and uh, in retro perspective, it was probably too ambitious as, a, as an objective as such. <coughs> um, now, uh, after we, we went through the neighborhood policy experience, uh, which was primarily bilateral in setting up the various kinds of plans and, and programs and joint action plans. Uh, there was also this sense that there was a need to bring forward something which became more stronger in terms of bringing the neighbors towards the east and the relation with the neighbors towards the east uh, more, more articulate. Uh, it wasn't enough just to have bilateral relations. There was so much in common between the six countries that there was a need to bring them into something. And that was, Professor Schumacher, of course, has much more of the academic background to it, but my remembrance of it is that we had this wish to show this is something that we can, that we can uh, create a kind of cooperation which would, which would lead to that kind of effect. Uh, and that was the background to the Eastern Partnership. Uh, let me say just one thing which I forgot when I was when, when describing the process forward. There has been lots of discussion about Russia and uh, where Russia came into this one. When we started to reflect on this uh, and when we started to build up the idea of neighborhood policy, our idea was that Russia, it was open for Russia. And uh, I remember vividly going to Russia in October 2003 uh, to discuss these issues. and uh, and. Uh, for understandable reasons, Russia declined to be part of it. But that didn't mean that we were in any way, in any way reflecting on, on seeing this as something which was built up, I'm not thinking about the neighborhood policy, but that's also true for the Eastern Partnership, as something that was built up against another country or against Russia. On the contrary, it was of course open, but there is a, this a decision to not to be part of it was something that was on the, on the, on the Russia side. So uh, the Eastern Partnership came about, and uh, that one, uh, uh, I think it was quite striking also that it happened, as you rightly pointed to, Professor Humacher, just after the Georgia War. And perhaps there were quite a few who was in those circumstances believing that it would be, have been more difficult to set it up. But it wasn't, and it, it went forward. And there were fairly, I think, 
high expectations when it uh, came into being. Uh, but there were also those saying that, uh, is this really going to work out? Uh, is it not go just another sort of window dressing which will not deliver what we would like to, uh, to see happening in terms of substance? And looking then on the achievements, I would argue quite strongly that uh, uh, if one reduced the term half full, half empty, I would argue that uh, what has happened over the last 10 years shows clearly that the, the cooperation and the distant partnership has, been, uh, has delivered. It hasn't delivered everything that everybody would like to see, but it has delivered. And there is substance in it as, as such. And I think it's important to not, we can't see it as something which is uh, completely uh, left aside of the development of the bilateral relations between the EU and the individual countries. I think they need to be seen together, how this has developed as, as, uh, as, as, as. So let me start with the bilateral track, because I think that is important. Uh, where our view on it was that it should be clear differentiation and that uh, that is what we should, should build it on. And, and we created this uh, approach of association agreement and possibility of deep and comprehensive free trade agreements, which, which I think is a, it's a terrible acronym, DCFTA. But in terms of substance, association agreement together with the DCFTA, it's very, very ambitious. It's very, very ambitious. Because of what is de facto means for those countries who would like to be part of it, it means that if they commit to it, which is difficult, and we just, Professor Schumacher and I discussed just before the, the meeting today, it's very difficult for economic actors. Uh, but what it means in long term is de facto, to a large extent, access to the internal market when it comes to goods and a bit beyond goods as well. And then, of course, the association agreement in broader terms uh, opens up for a very close cooperation in various areas and not least provides also a basis for putting into place the reforms when it comes to values and to uh, what Europe stands for in a very concrete way. And, uh, and our reflection behind that was that by putting into place such a joint commitment between the EU and the individual country, it would be helpful for the rather difficult reforms that these countries uh, would have to go through in the transition that they had decided to move ahead of. And I think when we look on the, how it has worked, uh, I would argue that, uh, that this framework has been helpful. Um, one could argue that the Maidan revolution would not have happened unless this framework would have been there. I think one could argue very strongly that the reforms that we have seen in Georgia uh, has been to a large extent inspired by the framework and helped by the framework. And of course the improvement that is there to be, to be taken in Moldova uh, is clear. Uh, there the framework is there and the opportunity to move in that direction is there. Of course the political will needs also to be there and there it's clear that in the case of Moldova there needs to be further efforts than maybe than, than what one would have expected that we entered into that, into that agreement. And similarly, when it comes to the others, uh, I think the kind of agreement that we've entered into with Armenia has been important, uh, both the negotiations and now the agreement as such. And the, uh, the discussions, negotiations with Azerbaijan is also important from that angle, with different kind of ambitions. And of course, Andrea, the discussions that we are having with Belarus and the new setup that we have in terms of critical engagement has, I think, bilaterally also been, been essential. Now, that has provided a basis for uh, the Eastern Partnership achievements, in a sense. I think that one cannot isolate one from the other, because, as you said, Professor Schumacher, there are elements in the uh, Eastern Partnership which is directly linked to uh, the elements in the bilateral relations. Uh, the whole issue of values, uh, call it democracy, call it good governments, call it rule of law, call it fighting corruption, call it fighting international organized crime, to mention five elements. The whole issue of uh, creating the conditions for a uh, market economy that can deliver prosperity 
and uh, can be lead to the countries being able to compete in a global environment where uh, they one needs to be competitive. Fundamental reform or structural reforms of the economy. Uh, the whole issue of connectivity, uh, which is both in the bilateral relations, but also when it comes to the to the uh, European uh, Eastern Partnership uh, element, and not least the building of all these contacts and connections, be it uh, in terms of youth, be it in terms of relations between uh, cities, be it in the relations between uh, civil society and the civil society's role in that context. Uh, or be it in mobility more generally uh, as such. Now, in all, or in three of these areas, uh, I think one could argue Eastern Partnership now, that is, we have been fairly successful, we being the countries and Eastern Partnership as such. Uh, I think we can, in the economic development, we can see that concretely on the ground, uh, there has been positive effects in all the countries concerned, and I would argue strongly that of course, the bilateral relations has been important, but I would also argue that the Eastern Partnership, in bringing together and having these sections, has played a role in seeing to that uh, structures have come into place which has been conducive for economic growth. And you know, figures, I received figures here in the speech, which one could always sort of tell, 70,000 new enterprises, uh, lots of jobs, is small and medium-sized enterprise being supported, and so on and so forth. Uh, also, when it comes to the issue of people-to-people, -people, I think their Eastern Partnership has played an important role in, uh, in bringing together. And you, you, you mentioned, Vice Rector, the, the youth uh, summit or forum or conference we had yesterday. I think that's, that's, a, that's a sign of it. And uh, I presume that before Eastern Partnership, the contacts between uh, youth, between uh, uh, this kind of people-to-people -people contacts was was not as strong as it is, has been as effect of this. So there again, it's something that has done well. And um, the whole issue of education and education package, which, uh, which EU has, has did announce at the Eastern Partnership Summit uh, last year, uh, of 340 million, I think that is a sign of this kind of engagement and how important it is. And of course, the Erasmus, uh, which has enabled 25,000 uh, academic exchanges with Eastern Partnership countries. And we will increase that in the new uh, pers financial perspective that is now negotiated and will come into place in 2021. The ambition is to have a substantive increase on Erasmus. And we are also reflecting on whether we shouldn't look into other types of these kind of exchanges. Because it's shown so clearly between the EU, between EU member states, how essential it is for understanding, but also to create, once again, the right environment for prosperity. Learning to know about how others do and others live is important also not only for sort of being, being developing oneself, but also in understanding markets, in being able to thereby take in the, the opportunities that comes out of it. And I think also we have done quite a lot when it comes to, in, within the Eastern Partnership, to promote the whole issue of connectivity, be it the uh, trans-European networks, the 10 t investment action plan, which has, has identified uh, priority investments uh, for 4,800 kilometers of roads. Not bad, huh? Rails, ports, logistical centers, and the ambition is to get that into place by 2030. So there we have a clear action plan on how to do it and how to act it. And we will, from our side, see to that what we need to do in terms of financing, we will see to that that is going to happen. And we have it in the area of energy which I think personally is going to be one of the more important ones, and we'll come back to that, by, by what has happened on the energy efficiency side. The energy fund that is now being set up in Ukraine is, uh, is impressive. And uh, as an example of how to, uh, uh, by, by that kind of, uh, of instrument, meters, uh, investments, uh, refurnishing, can do a, a very, very much in, in, in cutting down the energy consumption. And that model, I'm sure, is something that could inspire Belarus, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and by the way, it can inspire Egypt, Tunisia, Morocco, and Algeria as well. Because the, energy, the, the, energy, the issue of energy is something that is going to be key for the future 
from the uh, from the angle of sustainability, and and that's obviously something that's going to be very important. And uh, also, let me also I mentioned it, the uh, the cooperation between mayors, uh, cities, uh, the 400 municipalities that have signed up to the convenient of, of mayors on the climate and energy goals, uh, which is going to be once again inspiration for reforms. And uh, the ambition there is to reduce the CO2 emission by 20 million tons by 2020. Uh, and that is equivalent to 500 million trees, just to see what we can, how we can sort of clearly describe it. Now, what are the remaining challenges? I think one of the challenges is what Professor Schumacher pointed to, uh, the whole issue of values. Um, the, it's true that if you look on the Freedom House statistics, uh, this is not only for neighbours, this is beyond. If you look on Freedom House statistics on uh, free countries, you will see the impressive increase from 1989 up to somewhere in 2008. And then you will see that there are less countries who are going from unfree to free, and more countries that are going from free to unfree. And unfortunately, that is happening also in the neighborhood. And it's also happening at other places, as we all know. Now, um, that is something which I think uh, in the future, now talking about the future, uh, is something that uh, one needs to reflect on within the Eastern Partnership. How, how shall the East, what can, the, what can one within the Eastern Partnership do more efficiently in order to promote those values which are fundamental from a European point of view. But I think we shouldn't be there to patronize from the EU side. The reason why we say they are fundamental is because they have delivered a society which is free, which delivers prosperity, and which happens to be quite a lot the envy of people outside Europe. And I'm saying that as European, and I think we should not be shy of saying that. Uh, but that means that we have to, to reflect on issues such as can one within the Eastern Partnership promote better reforms of judiciary? Is there issues relating to uh, fighting uh, corruption that could come into the Eastern Partnership reflection? Issues relating to asset declaration, for instance, which in the Ukraine case is, is a very important issue. Um, are, there, are there issues relating to transparency, which can be further promoted through the Eastern Partnership and the instruments that are, are available to us in that, in that context? And I'm saying that not only because it's important for values, because it's also important for the economy. If you look on what are the major barriers to foreign direct investments, you will find in all the surveys that have been done that there are issues relating to building permits, there are issues relating to how the public administration works, there are issues relating to financing, but there are issues relating to corruption, there are issues relating to how the judiciary works that comes up very, very high on the list which are in the minds of people who would like to do investments. And that's not only foreign direct investment, that is also about investments being done internally in the country's greenfield investments. So also from that angle, it's important to have that in mind. Independent media. It's clear that media plays a very important role in holding the executive to account, and for that sake, other parts of the public administration and it's also clear that when we are looking into the Easter partnership, the uh, level of media independence, of media freedom, is low. And, uh, and it is an issue, I think, to reflect on how, how can we use the Eastern partnership in the context of, uh, of the future in order to try to drive that forward. I think we also need to reflect on civil society and how, the, the, how one can try to develop civil society in a more, even better way. And Professor Schumacher and I discussed it just before. In my view, we probably have already a fairly good uh, understanding of civil society in the form of human rights defenders and all the other important elements in that area of civil society. But there is also the broad issue of civil society in, which has not to do with those elements. 
Uh, and uh, it could be everything from farmers' organizations to uh, organizations that are looking after specific interest groups, etc. And I think we need to reflect on how can the Eastern Partnership help to give those organizations more space and be able thereby to contribute to prosperity and to the development of the society as such. So that are some of the issues that, that I think we, we need to have in mind. Uh, I think climate change, I mentioned, and energy is absolutely essential. It's going to be the priority as far as I see, or if not the, a very important priority in what is going to happen in the EU in the future. There is a need to go towards the SDGs, and they are clearly pointing to the need to cut CO2 emissions, but also to see to that the energy sector becomes more efficient. And that, I think, we, can, we should look into how what efforts we are doing within the EU can be transmitted into the discussion on the Eastern Partnership, within the Eastern Partnership, and use that, that instrument in order to help the countries who are in that context to address this issue. The circular economy, similar and the greening of the economy goes together, important elements to also take it up. And there is the issue of cyber security and security more, more generally, which is, I think, going to be also an interesting issue, linked to the digital. And, of course, in that context, the disinformation, the fake news. Uh, the dark web is reality. You can buy today if you want to see a journalist being attacked. Not attacked physically, but attacked via the web. You can buy a demonstration in the street, if you would like to. You can, you can buy elections. And I think this is something which also needs to, to be reflected on within the EU, of course, but something that also is relevant within the context of the, of the uh, Eastern, Eastern Partnership. Now, um, I think the, all these elements, I think, is, is uh, and, and those also that Professor Schumacher mentioned, I think is something that, that probably would be useful to discuss now, but also something that would, pro I hope, come in at the high-level conference on the 10th anniversary that will have, be held in May in Brussels. And uh, maybe it is a good idea to start the reflection period there uh, and uh, see to that as many interests as possible come in. and. Uh, keeping the eye towards uh, what I hope will be a summit in 2020 somewhere. And maybe that summit in 2020 somewhere could be the, the launching pad for, uh, for the Eastern Partnership beyond 2020. It would be useful not only because the very successful approach of 2020 has run to an end by 2020 by definition, but I think it's also something that, that will be important, important at SAS. So, I think I stop here, but I would hope that uh, both the elements that Professor Schumacher mentioned and maybe a bit of what I brought up here could, uh, could enrich the discussion that we will have today. And we will, from the part of us who are working for the European institutions, we will listen very, very carefully to what you are saying today. And uh, uh, we, will, we will, I can assure you that we will bring them into our reflection. We will very much appreciate that it's not only the, the one professorship that exists on neighborhood, but beyond that, taking part, taking part in that reflection and, uh, and seeing to that we get a rich discussion over these days, but also a rich discussion continuing towards May and beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Danielson, for, um, and I think I can speak on behalf of everyone here, a very honest um, and at the same time very realistic um, account of where we stand um, 10 years after um, the Prague summit. Um, I, I value in particular um, the holistic um, approach that you took um, in, in, in outlining what and what not um, the Eastern Partnership has achieved, and that you also reminded us, in fact, that um, this has been, from the very beginning, conceived as an inclusive and, and open um, process, um, reaching out to literally everyone in, in the Eastern neighborhood or beyond our Eastern borders, um, and has never, been, has never been meant to antagonize or compete um, with anyone in the East. Um, I would also like to thank you for um, having brought into the discussion already the distinction between the bilateral and the multilateral component. Um, and um, 
the extent to which, um, in particular, the bilateral has contributed um, to putting into place, at least in some Eastern Partnership countries, certain structures or helped putting in place those structures um, that literally 10 years ago um, were not um, present. Um, lastly, um, I would also like to thank you for um, pointing the finger into the wound. Um, and that is, of course, the, the values debate and the extent to which we, within the European Union, but also um, in Eastern Partnership countries, have not yet sufficiently managed, succeeded in consolidating all those values um, that you refer to. And I appreciate the very fact that you, in your capacity as a representative of the European Commission, um, reminded us of, of the commitment and ambition of the European Commission and, by extension, the European Union um, to not um, let go of this um, particular issue, as many observers um, tend to claim, now that we have the global strategy, which claims to focus, well, I dare to say more on pragmatism rather than on principles. On this very note, once again, thank you very much, Mr. Danielson. I would now like to bring the panelists of the very first panel onto the stage so we can start with our deliberations. Thank you again.